for the last presentation of this group here. We have Diane Geodi Francesco from Xavier University and also uh, two other colleagues who are joining through the live stream. So uh, I will let her talk. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm Diane Cho Di Francesco. I'm from Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm an associate professor of Spanish, and I'm also director of our Center for Teaching Excellence. And my colleagues are Carolina Maturet de Paris, and she is our coordinator and facilitator of our, a large network of a community of practice of colleagues in Jesuit universities in both Latin America and the U.S. And the organization in Latin America is called Aufs Hau. And um, my third colleague is Oscar Kennedy Mora, and he's in Cali, Colombia, presently, at the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana. And we're presenting to you today to talk about possibilities for um, how we can create telecollaborative tele experiences that promote significant and transformative learning. Um, so many times I have collected data in the past or observed the reflections of my students participating in telecollaboration. And oftentimes their first reaction or the reactions that you have also seen uh, highlighted in, in Robert O'Dell's keynote, where students are fascinated by the similarities that they, that they encounter. You know, oh, wow, I'm so surprised that we share uh, we share likes as far as interests as far as music and movies and and our our free time activities and and i 've even encountered um, comments such as wow they 're people just like me <laughs> and so <laughs> what 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 we what we were interested in looking at was how could we get students beyond that initial noticing and comparing stages in the telecollaborative process and the reflection that follows. And so we, we looked at tra tell, uh, transformative learning, which is a learning theory mostly um, having to do with adult learning. And um, a quote by Patricia Cranton, Trans transformative learning refers to making meaning out of experiences and questioning assumptions based on prior experience. Students' habitual expectations are the product of experiences, and it is those expectations that are called into question during transformative learning processes. So we want, what, what I looked at then were characteristics of transformative learning. And um, the list you see here, um, it's participatory and collaborative. It's also driven by critical self-reflection, which we'll look, we will look at many of these characteristics further along, but specifically critical self-reflection. Um, it's discourse plays a, a vital role. Uh, students are questioning assumptions that they have, their prior assumptions. It involves making meaning uh, out of experiences. Educators are facilitators in the learning process. Um, it's also self-directed, and learners act on their learning. So I took those characteristics and looked at it, um, looked and compared it to what we do in synchronous, synchronous telecollaborative sessions, and these are video conferencing one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, with our students, and so you see that students participate and collaborate with their virtual partners during this session. They're guided to self-reflect, and uh, we hope that there's evidence of deep learning, and, and we'll see further along in the presentation evidence of that. Um, the focus is on communicating with their virtual partner. Students can be guided to examine their assumptions and their stereotypes. Learners interpret the input of the second language during their interactions. Um, as instructors, we facilitate the sessions, and these are synchronous sessions, and, and the particular ones that we're going to talk about today took place during class time. So we're facilitating through not only our planning and our guidance, but also through our follow-up reflection and discussions that take place during class sessions. Um, the learners are managing, however, the flow of the interaction. We aren't, as instructors, dictating that flow. Um, and students report their, action, their plans or actions that they've taken based on their interactions. So how is transformative learning demonstrated? Um, it is demonstrated through an experience of dissonance and discomfort. And we will see actual quotes from students where they will say they felt uncomfortable with certain topics or discussing certain issues with their telecollaborative partners. It's also demonstrated through a self-examination of assumptions and habits of mind. It can be demonstrated through a reinterpretation of their sense of self in relation to the world and a changed self-perception. 
and also revision of their habits of mind. So our research question um, is, to what extent does telecollaboration contribute to transformative learning experiences in, the second, in a second language? And I'll tell you a little bit about our network. We're a virtual dual immersion network. Um, our, our program is a language and a cultural exchange. So we are talking about um, a dual immersion where we have classes in English in Latin America and, and, and groups of students learning Spanish in the US. The virtual language practice is through authentic and real-time conversations. Um, we, we have evolved from basically two practitioners to um, a huge number of collaborating faculty members, 200, and more than 27,000 students have participated since 2006. Um, so uh, we've, we've had quite a few participating students over time. And I have participated for uh, seven years, but my, my colleague in this research, Oscar Mora, was one of the first practitioners. Um, also, a little bit more about our network. We have faculty from different universities working together to create better and more significant learning experiences for our students. Through dialogue and collaboration, we have learned to respect our partners, and we provide life-changing experiences for all who are involved. This particular um, data that I'm going to show you is based on a project that, um, of telecollaboration that Oscar and I um, ran. It's basically a pirate po pilot project. There were 19 students enrolled in a 300 level Spanish course at Xavier University. All the students enrolled in the, in the course were either majoring or minoring in Spanish. And six cited previous experiences with telecollaboration experiences or sessions in sp other sp previous Spanish courses. Oscar had 15 students enrolled in beginning English at uh, his university in Cali, and none of those students had any experience with telecollaboration. Uh, the background of our sessions, we, we, had, we conducted six telecollaboration sessions spaced over 12 weeks during the semester. Our universities are of comparable size. The pairing of the students for each session was random, so students didn't necessarily have the same partner each time. And due to attendance and a bit of a size difference in the enrollment, sometimes the US students had to form pairs so that there was a, a triplet. You know, They were speaking to one Colombian, and they, they were uh, pairs of students. But these sessions were all done during class. They were all synchronous and video conferencing. And we utilize the platform Skype, which has been mentioned previously. Um, these are the themes of our sessions, and I'm not really going to emphasize a lot about the themes other than to say that um, they were not separate assignments. So the theme was, you know, students worked on the same theme in, in both groups, no matter, um, although they were at different levels in their language development. So for instance, one session was just basic introductions. Another was for them to present their favorite places and the presence of language studied in, in their own communities. They presented sites, uh, tourist sites in their country, so they, got, they each got a sense of, oh wow, fascinating and interesting places to visit. Session four, uh, they were fascinated with, they were uh, to describe uncommon objects and foods in the first language and culture. So some examples, if you're wondering, well, what, what would that be? So the Spanish students, students had to describe what um, a pretzel is in, in, in Spanish, and what is black ice, or what is brunch? Uh, how about what is a dorm? So, um, and then the, um, the, the um, Colombian students had to think of terms in Spanish that they would also try to describe in English to their telecollaborative partners. Session seven. A very interesting session because basically we, we set up a framework for our sessions which involve their activation, their interaction, and then their reflection. It always followed that framework. So by session five, we invited students to design their own sessions. And then session six, we wrapped it up with memories of their childhood. So what did we do? We had these six telecollaborative synchronous sessions um, they were, uh, of course, they were dual immersion, so we split it 35, 30 minutes in English approximately and 30 minutes in Spanish. The students wrote reflective es es reflection essays after each session. However, what I'm going to talk about today are the final essays they wrote, which were 
500 to 800 words written by the participant at the end of the experience, summarizing what they had learned during the tele-collaborative experience. And for those final essays, we performed a line-by-line microanalysis and coding of the essays. And they were coded based on organizational categories. We specifically looked at intercultural development as defined by Lidicott and Scarino, so the noticing and the comparing, but also the critical self-reflection um, as, um, as it's um, reported in uh, tra Transformative Learning um, by Patricia Cranton. So some of the results. First of all, um, one issue to note is that the 15 essays that were submitted and analyzed by the U.S. students were required, a required assignment, whereas the six <laughs> essays by the Colombian students, it was an extra assignment. So, of course, that's something that we'll want to work on in the future. But as you see, you'll see the tabulations of the in instances of noticing versus comparing versus the critical self-reflection and we've reported percentages of each, but to note that the critical self-reflection, there were 153 instances by the U.S. students and 44 by the Colombian students. And then you'll see total instances also. So noticing, to give you an idea what is noticing and actually what are some of the quotes that you can see um, to give you more of an idea of noticing. Noticing is um, a declaration or an observation that the learner notices regarding the other culture. So it's simply, <coughs> excuse me, noticing something such as a practice or a product. And you'll see some of the quotes actually from the essays really demonstrate that this is either, this is a noticing of exactly a practice or, or a product. Colombians spend a lot of time with their families. They don't live at the university. The Colombian first-year students are young. They're 16 or 17 years old. They're concerned with taking care of the environment. English is very important for all professions. And then one of the quotes from the Colombian students um, was, they like you to ask about the weather and things like that. These are simply, you know, very superficial. What did they notice about the other culture? Whereas comparing, of course, that's that level of comparing and I, seeing those similarities, typically, but also sometimes comparing, you know, will we'll show the, the, the differences. So they make a statement about comparisons of the two cultures. And some of the, the quotes to give you a sense of what we mean by comparing. A car is very important in the U.S., not as commonly owned in Colombia. They live at home with their families. It's really important for them to learn English. For us, it's not so important to learn Spanish. Although we live in other countries, we share many of the same activities and favorite things like video games, music, and movies. The work ethic and discipline of students there is something we should use as an example. And another that sort a of... US student or Colombian student? That was a Colombian student. And finally, a Colombian student said, oh, they're just as nervous as we are with these telecollaborative sessions. <coughs> Excuse me. So critical self-reflection, what are, what are we looking for? How did we define critical self-reflection according to Patricia Cranton? She says that critical self-assessment uh, uh, reflection involves the self-assessment of beliefs, feelings, values, questioning of assumptions and beliefs, and change self-perception a reinterpretation of the sense of self in relation to the world. And also it could be, and you'll see in some cases when I show you some examples, an actual stated plan of action based on the telecollaborative experience. And here are a couple of examples. What I learned, and this is a US student, what I learned from this experience is that although I try to appreciate cultural differences, I still subscribe too much to the various stereotypes of different peoples. I felt sad and frustrated about my reflection of these stereotypes that without thinking I incorporated these images into my daily life. And a Colombian student reflecting said, Colombian culture is very beautiful and thanks to this experience I have learned to appreciate it more. Some more examples for you. I learned to be more humble in my interactions with other people, including <coughs> friends and family, because I can never understand exactly what is going on in another person's life without talking to that person. Another, we live in a world where people judge instead of asking questions. 
something that we can change. We can facilitate in an environment of peace and understanding, a place where people feel comfortable and excited to share about themselves and their lives. And of course, you can see the, the thought process of perhaps a plan of action there. Um, here's a plan of action as well. Tile collaboration has inspired me to start more conversations with other people just to converse and to have a better cultural understanding of other students on a daily basis. I want to start more conversations with other students about their beliefs and customs. And uh, a, final, um, a final comment. My customs are not the only customs in the world, and that's a good thing. <laughs> a couple others. Um, one that was very interesting to me. Many people my age don't know how to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Telecollaboration was a good opportunity. It's forced us to have a real conversation and to listen to others. I think that student was imagining, okay, we actually don't have face-to-face -face conversations anymore. It's all texting, right? Um, another quote, this, this world is full of hate, judgments, and stigmas. It's important for my generation to create social change. I believe we have the capacity to create a world of social acceptance and respect. We're breaking down barriers through telecollaboration. Some of the recommendations that uh, we've come up with from this uh, preliminary set of qualitative data, considering the significant role of the critical self-reflection in the telecollaborative learning experiences, practitioners should consider employing a framework for guiding students. And perhaps your framework might include really considering the types of topics, themes, and projects which encourage students to look at social justice issues and also to encourage more critical self-reflection. Uh, we should provide prompts that facilitate this kind of reflection. We should also examine the critical self-reflection as a key aspect of sig uh, significant and transformative learning. Provide, perhaps providing some examples for them and perhaps even engaging students in the process of noticing, comparing, and reflecting and critical self-reflection for each session. Uh, after each uh, telecollaborative session. And um, also, um, for conclusions, um, through this process of noticing, comparing, and critical self-reflection, telecollaboration demonstrates the potential to provide significant learning and transformative learning experiences. Employing a framework for guiding students can facilitate more deep critical reflection, moving students beyond the stages of noticing and comparing cultural and linguistic elements and toward a richer, more transformative learning experience. The challenge to practitioners is to move students beyond the superficiality of the tandem experience. And I would like to share with you a concept that was introduced to us by one of the previous Je uh, Jesuit superior generals. He talked about, his name is Adolfo Nicolás, and he talked about the globalization of superficiality. And he talked about this, cus uh, this concept that has arisen due to the easy access of information, how we can friend others, and they might just be acquaintances or per, um, total strangers, and that this reality can lead us away from the more painstaking work of serious critical thinking. Um, we, need, we have a strong need to promote the depth of thought, the imagination, the curiosity, and the creativity um, in the learning experiences that we provide for our students. And um, at, at this point, I'd like to share with you my references, but also, you know, entertain any questions or comments you might have. First of all, I like the globalization of super superficiality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's it's a kind of a question and a comment to you and to all of us in the room, that it seems to me that um, we're all saying that we need to do things to help our students reflect more. And, mm -hmm. and I myself recognize as a teacher that I don't think I necessarily have the skills to get my students to that level of reflection. And so I think we've gotten to the point where we recognize that that teachers do need certain skills, language teachers, right? We're trying to do things beyond just teaching the grammar and et cetera. But I don't have those skills. And, and so what can we do to, I mean, we can talk about pre-service teachers and the things we're doing with them, but for those of us who are not pre-service, <laughs> and we've been in service for a long time, um, what, what do you, how do you 
if, if somebody who wanted to do this kind of activity came to you and said, oh, I want to do it, but I don't feel like I'm capable of getting that out of my students, what would you tell them? What would you suggest? Well, uh, basically, I think it's really, really encouraging them to, to get beyond, as I said, this simple noticing and comparing. And uh, it really doesn't take a lot of training. However, if you're interested in more diversity, inclusive type of training, there's plenty of material online through Centers of Teaching Excellence as far as, you know, how can we um, enhance and promote more critical thought to, um, you know, to, to really uh, push students to that more, to that more uh, critical level of reflection. But I, I think a lot of this, you know, I won't take credit for their reflections, yet, yet they, they, they really did hit this deeper level um, based on, I think it also has a lot to do with the types of uh, topics that we choose for them, um, how much, as, as was brought up earlier, how much uh, discussion and reflection follow each session. I think it's a total framework. I don't think it's simply, oh, I'm going to get this kind of significant learning experience just by putting two students in a room to talk. And this is really one of the major topics that we've been discussing during this conference. I do think it's a total framework. And I'm, I'm sure um, all of my experiences working with Oscar, because he, you know, I've been doing this for seven years, but he's been doing the synchronous uh, sessions longer than I have. Um, he's a great partner. And um, the two of us, I, I think as well, we have been able to accomplish a lot because we've worked together so long. Thank you. I have a question about the topics. Mm -hmm. Were these selected by the instructors or by the students? Well, um, as, as, you, uh, uh, as I, I briefed you on the topics, um, Oscar and I did negotiate choosing the topics. However, it was his idea and it worked out so well you wouldn't believe it um, because the students took it very seriously to create their own session, which was session five. So having gone through four sessions with a very solid framework, um, and of course, this, this was you know, part of a grade, part of an, you know, but part of a class activity, however, on both sides. However, the students seem to take that very seriously. And also, um, it involved a level of, actually what we're talking about, um, their imagination, their creativity, uh, thinking about, you know, what, what do I wanna discuss, you know, on a deeper level? And I think very quickly after the introductions and kind of the favorites, very quickly they get through that and they want to get to a deeper level of discussion. Well, of course, my Spanish students being, you know, taking, you know, the course was phonetics and dialectology, um, you would think, okay, these were advanced students. No, they're all over the place, mm -hmm. you know, so. Um, I can't say that they were all advanced learners. Um, and Oscar's learners, he had, he had several false beginners, but he also had, he had beginners. I think part of, part of what we're seeing too that is really important is how you prepare students for this experience, right? If you teach them about active listening, if you, if you talk to them about you know, this, this what, what are they engaging in here, you know? It's not just throwing them into the situation and saying, here, talk to this person and you'll improve your language and you might learn a few things about the culture. There's a, a, a lot, we can do a lot to train our students to actually interact, but on a level where they're, they realize that, oh, I have a lot to do to help someone improve their language and Actually, there's a lot at stake with that because learning English in Latin America is really important. And then they also see that, however, their partners are doing them a great service. So they, they can see, they, they learn to see both sides of that also. I actually had a question if you oh, okay. <laughs> allowed me to. Um, I guess I was just wondering when you said that they, the, the partners sometimes switched and then sometimes they had two people who had to get together for a group of three. Uh, I mean, how much did that, did the frustration come out? How, how did that, uh, do you think that that affected any of the conversations or did you see that in some of the responses? Just maybe getting tired of having to introduce themselves and switch and 
the kind of fatigue of going through those same conversations um, they've already had. Yeah, it, it's that's an interesting um, that's an interesting sort of area that you could actually study because um, students will actually some students will say, "I want to have the same partner every time," because maybe they're 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 creatures of habit, right? There are other students that are more adventuresome, and they'll say, I really like switching it up. And de depending on you know, how you structure, again, it's back to the framework, um, they want to enter into that deep conversation early. So you know, a lot of the you know, introduction and you know, that, they move beyond that fairly quickly. Many, not all. Um, and, and, and another thing, it's often like what you read on your course evaluations if you're instructors. You'll have students that say, I love the textbook. And then you'll have other students that say, I hate the textbook. So it's the same, I, I don't think we can, I don't think we can, you know, they, they all have different interests and we can't really serve all of their interests exactly like they would like them to be served. You know, and we can't have control over the fact that attendance might vary, or we don't have the same exact same number of students on either side. And they have to learn that to be flexible, and many of them will talk about learning. They learned how to be flexible, to be good listeners, to realize that um, technology just doesn't always work the way you want it to or expect it to. And, um, that, but there's still a lot that can be gained from the experience. Okay. Thank uh. you.